Hi, welcome to the 13th floor. I'm Marty Duda, and today we have with us Simon Coldrick. Hello welcome, there. Simon. Simon, you and uh, Charlotte Purdy have directed a film called By the Balls. That's right. And it's, uh, it deals with rugby. Um, among other <laughs> among things. Among other things. So for folks who don't know anything about it, give us just like the brief overview of what, what the film is about. It's the story of the All Blacks. Mm -hmm. um, and it's set between the years 1985 and 1987. So it starts with um, the decision to go to South Africa on a rugby tour. Um, and this follows the 81 Springbok tour and all that happened there. Yeah. And, and it goes through to the World Cup, right. which was and the first ever World Cup. Right. And of course, back then, rugby was not a professional sport. Nobody was getting paid for it. That, so, that's right. Um, so players that, had jobs. Yeah. Um, so they were fitting in their, their professional lives with their, their sporting careers. So. And, and that kind of complicated things with that rebel team that went to South Africa, right? That's right. I mean, if you step back, what happened was um, the rugby union in their wisdom decided they wanted to um, take up the invitation to go to South Africa in 85. Um, and if you go back four years, you had all of the social unrest from the 81 tour. And before that, they went. Um, the All Blacks went to South Africa in '76, which actually created a chain of events because you had the Olympics in Montreal in '76. Twenty-five African nations boycotted it as a result of the All Blacks going to South Africa. Ah. Um, so you had that fallout. <laughs> Fast forward to '81 when they, the um, South African team comes to New Zealand, and you have the games, you know, called off. You have planes bombing the pitches with <laughs> flour. Um, so um, it wasn't a popular decision in the making and, you know, they hadn't learned the lessons, but they took up an invitation in 85, um, but the public were against it again. They were. They were. So ultimately the tour was cancelled, uh -huh. which meant that the, a lot of the players at the time um, who were chosen to go um, didn't get the chance to go to South Africa. Um, so a rebel tour was hatched among the team that didn't get to go in 85. Uh -huh. um, and that's kind of where the story really kicks off, right, basically. Right. And um, things go downhill from there. Because yeah. most of the team went, but several Well, all, players. all of the players that were picked to go in 85, bar two, right. um, went to South Africa on a tour under the name the Cavaliers. <laughs> right. um, and the two players that didn't were John Kerwin and David Kirk. Right. Um, and the story is very much from their point of view. Um, and also you've got Grant Fox and Buck Shelford who did go on the Cavaliers tour. Right. So it's um, some very frank and uh, surprising interviews um, and some major revelations, I'd say. That, you know, and there's some myths and things about what happened on the, the Rebel tour around things like payments and things. And right. um, we, we kind of get to the bottom of some of that. Oh, good. And, and it's revealed from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So were these guys happy to talk about this stuff? Um, I would say, that, I mean, David and John, because they didn't go. They were kind of on the right side of things, ultimately. Yeah, but I mean, I, I don't, you know, back in those days, I think you could also argue that um, the issues of apartheid and things, there wasn't the information, we didn't have social media, yep. you know, it wasn't readily available. So they pro probably, and they were young guys as well, mm -hmm. so they probably weren't across some of the issues like we are today. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, they were young. Um, and then add to that, you know, the desire to play South Africa, they were seen as the other great team to play. You yeah. know, they were the, the team they wanted to go and play. So that was taken away from them. Um, so, you know, uh, David talks of his feelings about not going and also what he thought of the other guys going as well. You know, those guys, that was the, a big moment for them. So they felt like they, they wanted to go there and that's why they went on the Rebel Tour. Yeah, yeah. But it came back and haunted them afterwards, obviously. Yeah, and so, I mean, ultimately they had to play together again with these other guys. Yes. Um, <laughs> When they um, came back, though obviously there was some kind of punishment. I don't want to give too much away for people yeah, who haven't yeah. seen it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, when the players who went on the Cavaliers tour finally came back, um, David was made captain, David Kirk. Um, and there was a fair bit of friction. Um, and as I say, that's sort of the journey of the story as right. well. And David Kirk was made captain kind of... 
Because of injury to the other captains? Uh, no, well, what happened was um, the captain was was um, basically banned for some games. Ah, I see. Um, and David, who was playing for Auckland at the time, was was given the job. And and the first big test they had was what was become would become a famous game where they were sort of named the Baby Blacks, <laughs> where they played France. Right. So um, that's kind of. That was the birth of the baby blacks and then you know um, as the punishment went on and basically more and more of these players from the cavaliers came back david was basically confronted with a team that um i I'm trying to say it without giving the game away too much but you know there was it, it was a difficult time for right. him and um yeah and the team ha was very incohesive it, there was a lot of um kind of infighting and things like that um, they weren't doing well, so it was in terms of you know the performance of a team. They were at their lowest ebb. Yep. The country wasn't in love with rugby. They <laughs> they didn't care for what they'd done. The you know the people rose up when they they did um, try to go to South Africa and they rose up when the Cavaliers went. So you know it, it was a, it's probably the lowest time in the All Black mm. history, I'd say. Mm. Now you mentioned France, and that's kind of the other part of the, the controversy is the whole Rainbow Warrior thing happening around the same time, and of course, ultimately the All Blacks ended up playing France in the World Cup. Final. They did. The other side of the story is we've tried not to make it wholly rugby. And, right. um, Charlotte, um, who's the co-director and produced this, she's the one who came up with the idea of the story, and so all these sort of um, political events, social events, and the All Blacks, and kind of came up with the idea of the story because she didn't want it just to be about All Blacks, yeah. because there's a lot of social context. Yeah, you had the, you know, you had the nuclear testing, mm -hmm. um, you had the Rainbow Warrior bombing, and then if you think about it, you know, it, it created a lot of tension between the two nations. So then you go and travel to France and play rugby against them all day. Came here, um, it, it made it more interesting, and it kind of puts it in a different perspective. And that's the thing, because the, the whole point was, you know, the rugby union was very much of the view sport and politics don't mix, and a lot of people did at that time. Mm -hmm. And the story sort of shows that you cannot separate right. them. So it seems like it kind of forced rugby to grow up a bit. It did, and also the country. I mean, <laughs> rugby did have to grow up, and, and basically the, the guys sort of get their redemption. I mean, most people, I, I'm guessing you what happened in the World Cup final. <laughs> so, you know. I don't um, think that's a secret. <laughs> no, I don't think that's a secret at all. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was about the country coming together, the rugby coming together as well. So, right. Right. Now you mentioned Charlotte, so you guys have co-directed this thing. How, did, how does that work? Um, it, it works very well. I'd worked with Charlotte uh, years ago on a project about Erebus, right. um, about the, the police rescue on the mountain. And we'd sort of talked about doing something together ever since then. And, and when she got this project up and running, she, she called me and said, look, can you get involved? So I was, I was thrilled. Mm -hmm. um, we come from different perspectives, I guess, different points of view. I'm, I'm an editor mm -hmm. by trade. Um, she's a journalist and director. She did the, the, the amazing interviews um, with David, Buck, Grant and John um, and got, as I, as I was saying, very candid and, and quite surprising interviews from them. So we, we kind of complemented each other, I, I hope, I think. Yep. Um, I think she'd agree with that. Um, right. So, you know, we brought different, different things to the table, I think, when it came to cutting. So them. I'm assuming that you kind of were more in charge of the construction of the film? Um, yes, I, I came from it from the post perspective. I mean, obviously, Charlotte had these ideas mm -hmm. and how she saw the film working and then it was a you know it was the best ideas win basically mm -hmm. the ones we didn't agree with we kind of put to the end of the process we worked through the film and then we'd we'd sort of reevaluate any bits we were kind of like i think it should be this i think it should be that but we you know we we came to an agreement in the end and you know it works it's, yeah. we trusted the process uh -huh. and uh now of course you're not a, a, a native kiwi no you're from the I'm from England. England. Yeah. And uh, you've been here for how long? About 15 years? 15, 16 years. Yeah. So how does that, uh, and you're doing these films, uh, especially if you're talking about the All Blacks, very Kiwi uh, content. Does it be coming from the outside uh, help you have a different perspective or? I think so. I mean, I, it, it's funny. I, I, I saw things in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that was quite refreshing 
for Charlotte, but obviously she, I wasn't as knowledgeable about the subject matter until we started working on it. Yeah. And then I obviously had to do quite a bit of research myself to, yeah. to kind of school myself on some of these events from the past. Um, but look, you know, I'm, I'm a huge rugby fan. I've always been in awe of the All Blacks. <laughs> I remember going to see them in 1979. My dad took me to Twickenham right. um, to see them for the first time. So, it, you know, I, I kind of, as I say, as a rugby fan, I, I'm pretty much aware of right, the right. All Blacks. Who isn't? Yeah, you're right. That's true. Um, so you, um, it sounds like you possibly are coming at it from the point of a, of a casual fan because you, you had to learn quite a bit about the nuts and bolts of the story in order to make the film. I'd, I'd say I knew quite a bit about the component parts of the story. So I knew right. Rainbow Warrior. Yeah. Um, I knew the, the Baby Black, so I'd obviously heard of the 81 um, tour. Mm -hmm. I, so I knew bits and pieces about all of the subjects. I didn't see them in the context together. Yeah. Um, some of the social issues in New Zealand at the time I wasn't so aware of. Like um, what? Uh, well, I mean... We, at the beginning of the film, we do this um, sort of pop culture montage to put people back into the period. Right. And there were things like um, Carlos Days I wasn't aware of, you know. <laughs> um, so that was, uh, um, you know, an education for me. So yeah. we, we've kind of tried to put those bits in for content. GST came in in that period yeah. as well. You know, I mean, it was that decade, because I, I came here in 96 from the States, and I'm an editor too, and I was lucky enough to work on a documentary about the political changes in the 80s and all that. And mm. This is like a real eye-opener about what was going on in this country during that yeah. decade. David Longy and Jeffrey Palmer and all that stuff as well. So it must have been a lot of... I always thought that Kiwis were extremely resilient with all that change happening and their lifestyles changing so much. I think so. I mean, I don't think it was unique to New Zealand, though, in that right. period. I think the 80s was, you know, there was a lot going on around yeah. the world. Um, but, yeah, very resilient. I mean, I think Kiwis, you know, they've, they've always stood by their values as well. You know, that's why you see what you did in, in 81. You know, that mm -hmm. was massive civil unrest on, on issues people felt very strongly about. So they push back against the system, and I think that's something I'd say Kiwis are not afraid to do. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, the, the film is, gets its premiere tonight, is that what? That's right. It's the world premiere tonight, <laughs> <laughs> if that means anything. Um, it, what, it, it'll be on TV later this year, I don't know when, right. um, if, uh, as part of the Sunday Theatre Strand. Right. Um, but tonight is is the the premiere, so very exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be exciting. And you you mentioned before we got the cameras rolling that the film was pretty much just finished a couple of weeks ago. So what kind of things are you doing at the last minute to kind of tweak oh, it to get it ready? Oh, I mean, the, if you work back from doing all the sound and the grade mm -hmm. and things, you have to allow you know a few weeks just to do all the polish so it, it right. sounds great and looks great in the theatre. Yeah. Um, we would have loved more time to cut it, but then I would have spent far too long cutting it, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was just making sure there were there were some areas that we thought had we had we sort of explained that clearly enough. Um, there was a lo there's a lot going on in the story and in that period over the two years, so we had to find devices and ways of kind of jumping to the the important beats of the story. Right. Um, and in doing that, sometimes you you kind of overlook things that you think are clear because you've been working in the world for so long that you, f you take it for granted that right. it's not so obvious to other people. Yeah. So there was a bit of kind of massaging and sorting at the, even at the end. We've got a lot of, um, we use stills and, and headlines and media at the time. There's a lot of archive of the time. That'll be fun. <laughs> That's fun, but it's also a really difficult process. The 80s, as you probably remember, is a transition from film to videotape. Yep, yep. Um, computer system they wouldn't have had computer systems logging all this footage yeah so actually hunting down some of the material was um, a real challenge and getting it licensed as well because yeah. you you can find the footage but then you've got to get yeah, permission be allowed to use it <laughs> yeah. and and often there's all these little little lines in the in the contracts that suddenly go oh my gosh you know and and it's a panic so there were a, a few um, 
tense moments, I think, yeah. just, just getting it finished. And of course, uh, uh, um, you have your main subjects, who the interview subjects are rugby, ex-rugby players. Yes. Not known to be the most articulate people all the time. I mean, uh, they're better, I think, now than they used to be because they've had some media training, but I've seen endless amounts of uh, interviews with rugby players where they pretty much just spout out uh, cliches left, right, and center. So how did you guys draw that out of them? Uh, I think you'd be very surprised. Um, they are all really articulate guys. Yeah. Um, they've lived the life as well, um, and I think they've had time to reflect on those years, 30 years back. Um, and, and, you know, in a way, it's a sort of a legacy piece for them. Mm -hmm. So um, they're frank, honest, um, and, you know, you know I, I agree. You, I think what's happened now is the brand um, is so protected, it's so valuable that they are you know, they've got to be careful what they say. They're part of a system. Yeah. Um, and they're not allowed to say certain things and talk about certain things. Whereas these guys have kind of moved on. And as I say, they're, you know, they've lived their lives and they're, they're smart guys. Um, and, you know, they were quite open to talk. And Charlotte did a fantastic job in finding the ideas that she wanted to follow for the story and, and drawing that out to them. And they were happy to talk. Cool. Alrighty, well, good luck with the premiere tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming up here and talking to me about it. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Thanks and for having me. Yeah.